Okay, so I want to do a quick video, it's going to be fairly lengthy, but I want to discuss the idea and theory behind what an algorithm is, because I did a quiz for the students in the course, and the students typically are in one of two camps. So on one hand, you have students who have little to no program experience at all, and on the other hand, you have students that have been doing this for a little while. And each of these two camps usually give one of two answers. One, I have no idea what an algorithm is. I've never done it before. And two, they give me something computer science related, which would be like quick sort, bubble sort, maybe something to do with Dijkstra's, George Pass, stuff like that. But neither of these answers are in any way wrong. It is completely up to the user or the actual student's experience of what that word entails. Now, for those who have had no program experience, you've probably actually dealt with some algorithms whether you knew it or not. And then for the people that have been doing computer science for a while, algorithms aren't always tailored towards computer science or anything in that category or that field in general. It's a lot more broad than that. So that's what I'll do with this video is to go over the idea of what they are and then show some that I know everybody, or at least most people have had experience with in the past. So let's go ahead and take a look real quick. So if we look over here at Merriam-Webster's dictionary, we can look up algorithm, just the word itself. So we see a procedure for solving a mathematical problem as a finding the greatest common divisor in a finite number of steps that frequently involves repetition of an operation. More broadly speaking, we see that we have a step-by-step -step procedure for solving a problem or accomplishing some end. Now, nowhere in that definition does it say anything about computers, computer science, anything like that. It is very well understood that algorithms generally nowadays are tailored towards computer science. So that's why I said that that answer is not necessarily incorrect, but I wouldn't say it's also correct in and of itself. However, if that's an algorithm that you know, perfectly fine. But for those who don't have any experience in computer science, you know algorithms. Even if you don't know computer science, you know some step-by-step -step procedures, whether it be a theorem or a formula or anything like that, you've had experience with it. Now, if you actually look down here, see the current term of choice for problem solving procedure algorithm is commonly used nowadays with a set of rules a machine and especially a computer follows to achieve a particular goal. Not always the case though. So if you've ever done anything with a Rubik's Cube, that also has algorithms. It is definitely has something to do with the computer. So I have three more tabs up here that are geared towards different algorithms. First one we'll look at is the good old Pythagorean theorem, because I know that this is something that's taught very, very early on. So most people should have some experience with this. It's just finding the length of a hypotenuse of a right triangle. I'm going to pull the text editor. I'm going to go through and actually cut up these three different algorithms and just kind of go through writing them. I'm not going to create a bunch of different source code. I'm just going to write one file, generate multiple executables, which is not typically the way I would do it. Normally, I'd write different files, keep the source, but for this, it's just testing purposes. So it's also just a different method in showing how this would work. So bear with me for a moment. Let's take a look at things. So what is the Pythagorean theorem? states the sum of squared sides of a right triangle equals the length of the hypotenuse squared. So basically the good old a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Should be pretty familiar to most people. So let's take a look at this calculator. Side a, six, side b is gonna be 12. And calculate that. And you see the actual work being done here. The answer is gonna be 13.4164. So look at the actual thing. We have square root a squared plus b squared ends up being the square root of 180. Keep that number in mind for now. So, I'm gonna come over here. I, real quick, this is just a basic text setter. It is VS Code, particularly VS Codium, which is a fork of the original VS Code, but I digress. It's just a basic text editor. I have a terminal. This is all running on Linux. I'll discuss a few different things as I'm going through this. I'm gonna have another video on actually detailing setup. This is just my local environment. I'll actually show it running on one of the 
online compiler is probably online GDB, but I'm just going to do it the way I would do development normally. So, I have some basic directory on my system. I'm going to create a file real quick. I'm just going to name that test.c and get started. So, if you notice me looking over here, I have some sample code so I don't get too lost in this video. Oops. So, let's go and get started. So, include fragile.stf.h. Then I'm going to need to spell correctly my main function. Then zero. We have some basic starting points. So first things first, we want to do Pythagorean theorem. So I need two variables and a. Oh well, we are doing with square roots. We're not gonna have decimal points. We need double a. 0.0, b, 0.0, and double, I'm just going to do c. And you know what? I can set this one to 0.0, .0 for now. What we'll do, change my a and b to the actual values I want. So side a is going to be 6, b is going to be 12. This is basically just what I had on that calculator a second ago, so I should get the same result once I do the actual math. I have a variable to store this. So, let's take a look real quick. If we do c equals, we need to square these, so let's just say if I do a times a, plus say b times b. Now that should be the idea of a squared plus b squared, and I need to print it out. Go to print statement, the triangles, hot loose. Wow. There we go. Is, we're gonna do percent F, this is a placeholder for floating point values, this is gonna be double, so is f so i need to actually put my parameter of c in there so we should have double a six b this is going to be fingers This identifying the variables and whatnot, and this I'm not going to identify real quick, just because I'm going to change this a few times in a second. So, white up dot up here indicates I haven't saved the file. So save. I'm going to open up the terminal real quick, and I'm going to do clang s dot c. Let's do minus o. I'm actually just naming the file. I'll explain what all these commands are later on but I'm just compiling for right now. Actually, you know what? First part here is a compiler I'm running. I could do this with GCC. I know it's on my system. This is the file I'm actually passing into the compiler, which is what I'm writing here. This is going to be a flag that dictates the name of the output file that I'm doing. So I'm just gonna do dot out. If you were doing this on Windows, instead of doing dot out here, I mean, technically since I'm on Linux, I don't need to have a file extension at all, but it defaults to .out, so that's what I typically go with for examples. But if you're on Windows, you'll notice that it's gonna be .exe, and that's because how, how Windows does executable files is always just a .exe. So it's just different operating system. I'll detail that when I show setting up a C environment on those specific operating systems. But I digress for now. I do this, you know, up here, I get hypot.out. You notice I get 180. I'm gonna add a new line carriage up here. Just kind of not have this around the same line. And 180, if you remember, is what I need to get the square root of. So now I figure out how to do a square root. Well, easiest way to do that, we're just going to not do the actual math for it. We can actually take advantage of what is done at our math library. We're gonna do another include, this one not the standard input output, 
we're going to include the basic C math library. So we can actually pull a lot of really cool stuff from here. First thing we're going to pull is a function for square root. So we're getting the square root, you notice the purple parentheses here, highlighting here and here. It's going to be the square root of everything inside of it. So that's that 180 we got. The square root of 180. I the spaces just because it formatting bothers me, but we should end up getting the square root of 180 by doing this. I need to recompile every time I make any edits to a file. If I'm doing it locally, I need to recompile it to get a new executable. So if I don't, even though I made changes on this file and saved, you'll notice it's still 180 because I did not make a new executable. I want to recompile. I'm going to run to this linker issue. So that means I'm missing something in my command line and I just need to add this little flag right here to actually link it. Uh, I'll, if you're doing online GDB, this wouldn't be an issue. This is an issue in only particular scenarios. So, you know, it's, it's going to run now. That's just kind of a niche thing right there. I pop that out. I get 13.41648. So, what I got? 13.4164. Exactly what I want. Now, since we're on the topic of the math library, we can do a few more pretty interesting things. So, this is great and all for doing squares, but it's pretty limited. So, what if we did this instead? So, we did pow for power a2 pow b2. So, you notice know, right here, I'm doing function of power function here of a and 2, that's going to be a to the second power, this is going to be b to the second power, and I'm going to add them together, I'm going to get the square root of those results, and I should get the same exact answer, just like that. Now, it's really funny, because this is exactly the algorithm we want to do, we need a squared plus b squared equals c squared, so we add a squared and b squared together, we get the square root of that result, and that's Pythagorean theorem. So that's our algorithm. However, the math library can do just a bit more for us. And we can just hypot a and b and do that. Because since it's so common, the need to get the hypotenuse of a right triangle, the math library already has a function an algorithm for that, so yeah, we know how to do the math now, but if you ever actually need to do this, it's good in the math library. So that's pretty cool. So there's a lot of really cool things in these different libraries that we'll pull from that take a lot of advantage of people been doing this for years and years and decades, beyond decades. Because I mean, the language is like 51 years old at this point, so there's a lot of groundwork being done by other people, so it's not a bad starting point. So, that is our... Green theorem algorithm. So let's take a look at the next one. This will be doing the circumference and the area of a circle. So I have some base data in here already because I was playing with it earlier. So formula for the circumference is it's going to be the circumference equals 2 pi r, r being the radius. The area is pi times radius squared. So we have a few things to note here. I have my hypotenuse executable here. So I'm not going to lose this. But what I am going to do is I'm just going to kind of reset and get some new data. So for the circle, all I need is circle radius, I'm going to add me a little comment here, and we're dealing with pi, so I'm going to be doing doubles again because we're going to get decimal holding points, all that good stuff, it's not a big deal. So, radius, and just start radius, we're just going to do two. Here's what I had just a second ago, if I actually plug it in. 
you know, so you get two diameter four, circumference of 12.56637, and the area is actually the same, just because the math works out that way. If I change it to three, you'll notice it changes from 18.8 .8 to 28.7. Not a big deal. We're gonna start with two though, just because it's fun, because they're the exact same answer. But it goes. Let's do double circ diameter. Base data. Don't need the actual dot zero, but I just put it in there just for the sake of it. Hammer. Oh, so we get typos. I apologize in advance. Um, paying attention when I type, but not paying attention that closely to what I type. So if I misspell something, I apologize. So. Parameter equals well that's just gonna be the radius times two. And if I were to do this a circle and a parameter of percent f flash in let's give us a four so technically we don't need this right now mm, i'm gonna name this one work that out and start that out and the diameter is four. So that's good. But we need a little bit more here, so what we want well, the circumference next, right? Right, so the circumference I think is two pi r. Let's just make sure real quick. So two pi r, that is indeed correct. So two times pi times r. Well we already have two times R, which would be the radius, so we have the diameter, so let's just do circ, diameter, I need pi, well, I mean, I know that's 8.14 and a bunch of repeating decimals, but I think that this should be fine. I'm just going to copy-paste this. It has a... Once. some autocomplete here and I'm going to compile from my code and I get 12.56 and some zeros this is correct when 3.14 is losing a lot of your actual detail with pi you lose a lot of specification I'm trying to think of the word accuracy yeah you lose a lot of accuracy there you go but we'll, we'll touch on that in just a second. For now, let's just do area. So area equals uh, pi r squared, if I'm not mistaken. Let's do four times radius squared. Well, we have circ radius. And circ radius. I think that should be good. As an area, an area. We compile that. We're going to circle that out, and you notice we get 12.56 for both the circumference area. We know that they both should be the exact same. So technically, this is good, but we can improve upon this. Let's take a look what we can do. Let's go ahead and get that math function back because we never can change this. Do, but there's another thing we can do. So there's a thing in C and other languages called constants. And if you include a constant in a library, you can pull that into any file that you're using with that library. So since we're pulling the math library here, that means I have access to any constant in it. And if I look at these two 3.14s, then I can change that to this M underscore PI. I have that copied over from a window over here 
and I'm doing some VS Code nonsense to highlight multiple things at a time. It's just using Control D after I highlight, but I digress. Main point here is I can use the constant M underscore pi to get the math constant for pi, which will carry out a lot more accuracy. So if I recompile this, then you'll notice I get that 12.566371 that I was looking at much earlier. Matter of fact, I get a little bit more detail than what they have. So this is one example of taking advantage of this math library. It has a lot of different random constants in it that you'll need doing anything mathematically. And again, this could also be done a lot more efficiently. So if I want to improve this a little bit, then instead of saying this is 0.0, .0 I could just put these into a single line, like so. Compile. And just like that, we're good. Anyway, I could put this all in one giant print statement if I wanted to. I'd don't want to do that right now. It'd be hard to fit all properly without just going completely off the page. And I'm just going to leave it individual lines. Not a big deal. So, that gives us a hypotenuse that you can see here. This hypot.out. Uh, a circle. So we get the circumference and the area of a circle. And we had one more. What was that? So this is converting moles to atoms. Good old chemistry stuff. And anyone that's familiar with this should know that we need a particular constant called Avogadro's number. So to convert moles to atoms, you can use a calculator, yada, 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 yada. Use a formula, multiply the number of moles by Avogadro's number, which is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. And that will give you the number of atoms. But this one I want to go in particular to show some fairly interesting things that we can do with C. Now, one thing I also want to do we are not going to use the math library here because it does not have a constant for us. We had pi as a constant. That's really nice. Avogadro's number is not a constant there, to my knowledge. We just make it ourselves. What we can do, what we are going to do is before this in the preprocessor, very similar to our include, we'll write define. I'm going to name it num. You know, it's 6.022 times 10 to the positive 23rd. So notation wise, that is E plus 23. So 6.022, that's the basic part of it. And then times 10 to the 23rd can be substituted down to E plus 23. But this gives us a constant for Avogadro's number in our preprocessor. So anywhere in this, we want to use it we can use it. If you want to put that in your own library that you made, you could do that as well. And then you can pull it at any point and you have Avogadro's number there whenever you want. So, what we're gonna do a little mole. Do 1.5, let's actually just test that real quick. 1.5 should give us 9.033. We're gonna end up doing 9.0 because we're going to look at this and say oh 1.5 that's only one specific digit right here so we're just going to round um down i think it's going to be 9.0 let's we to the 23 so not a big deal so whenever we want to get the actual atoms we're going to look at let's name this mole out Atom count, do we have a num times mole counts? Specifically, I want to do and this is just because if I want to do a conversion like from atoms to moles, I would do atom count divided by avo num, so it just keeps it more consistent. But I had grits now. F. I have the actual text on the other screen, so I'm looking over here. So this is where things are going to get a little bit 
interesting because it's going to come down to displaying it. So what I'm going to do first, let's see what happens if I do this. There are set F's, it's going to be a placeholder there for a floating point value. Atoms, percent F balls, slash N. First one I want is going to be atom, oh, and then mole count. And I'm going to compile that. Uh, ooh, way too much. That's dot C minus O. And then we'll do pop it. Pop out Ravagadra. And I miss a semicolon. You can see I expected semicolon in the declaration, so very, very simple missing semicolon. My bad. All of a sudden, oh, I got count. And Right, so I get 9033, a lot of zeros, 7340032.1 zeros. Uh, I mean, technically, yeah, that's correct, but this is, this is some atrocious formatting. We don't want this. We want something more like what we see here. This 9.033E plus 23. We want that. So what we can do there? Well... Let's do this. We have one value here. And I want one significant digit because we're doing it like this. 1.5. And we want E. What's going to happen here is so we're using floating point, but we're using E notation just like we are up here at the top. And what's going to happen... Now all of a sudden we get 9.0e plus 23. This gives us that notation that we want. So it's not always just percent %f gives us the full on number. It gives us the actual value, which in that case was just way too much. It's completely unreadable, unusable. We'd want something dialed down a bit. So if we were to change this formatting up a bit, maybe instead do 1.5, we had 1.75. And the appropriate thing to do, we change this to 1.5 because we want two decimal places carried out. If we compile that, you notice know, so you get 1.05. Because if we change this back to 1.1, we get 1.1. It's going to round. We don't want it to round. We want that, that significant digit. We want it specific to what we want. So, now it's going to get 1.05. E plus 24. Be fine, so 1.75. I'll go over there, check out what that says. A second, 1.75 is gonna be 1.05 e plus 24. That's exactly what we want, that's exactly what we got. So now, all of a sudden, we have three different, completely different algorithms. We have the Pythagorean theorem, we have the circumference in the area of a circle, and now we have a way to convert moles to atoms and if you want to we can extend that further and talk to the math library talk about defining your own constants if you don't have any library accessible to them so there's a lot of stuff going on here but at the end of the day just because so i ask you like hey what's an algorithm you know you don't have to know computer science you don't need to know well this is a sorting algorithm this is a searching algorithm this is a shortest path algorithm all these different things yes those are all algorithms and that's perfectly great that's perfectly fine but just because you're not familiar with computer science, does that mean that you don't know algorithms to some degree? If you have any basics of calculus, you definitely know them. If you have any basics of trigonometry, you definitely know them. And basics of even just basic algebra, geometry, stuff like that. You definitely know some form of algorithm. Whether it's called that or not is a little bit irrelevant, but there is a little more apt names like theorems and formulas and stuff like that. This is just kind of showing how that all works. And again, like I said, I will show at least this particular one running in online GDB. If you wanted to follow along, if you're doing all that, I'll just run it real quick. That's like the language. My bad. So, yep, there we go. 1.05 E plus 24, 1.75 moles. Good to go. So, that is all I've got for this video. I really do hope this was helpful in showing some enlightenment on what an algorithm is, how it's not specifically tied to your science, even though 
generally speaking in today's world most algorithm discussion is tied to computers and hardware and all this different software nonsense but it's just the same as if you're doing it in chemistry physics any math related field or maybe it's just like rubik's cube and stuff like that those are all still algorithms or some step-by-step -step process we get to a beginning to an end so even if you did the basic distance formula there's an algorithm for that you can program it and you can create your own simulation stuff and do whatever you want so if you're familiar with how to actually do the mathematical work for it you can write a program for it that's the entire point of this video so i do hope that all of that made sense and generally i do hope that this helped and that you learned something so all that being said that's all i got i'll see you in the next video thank you for watching bye